Hello, hello, check, check. All right. <clears throat> My name is David Wynn, and this is History of Baptist Thought. Um, I have chosen for this assignment to do Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Um, one is because I have many of his books, and I am very interested in him, use a lot of his stuff. Um, so I thought he'd be a good idea. Probably a lot of people are going to do him from the class, but I just could not uh, miss the opportunity to um, do some research on him. So, um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> we got seven, ten minutes. Okay, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, born in 1834, 1892 he died. I believe his last sermon was about six months before he died in London. Um, he became a Baptist, 15 years old. Um, he came from a believer's background, um, not Baptist though. He broke the tradition. And uh, um, he attributed his conversion basically to, he got caught up in a storm, ended up being redirected somewhere. And um, from his destination, he ended up going to like a Methodist chapel and experience basically um, caused him to reevaluate everything, um, just his ideas. The main idea being infant baptism. Um, and then within, I believe it was like four months after that, he was baptized and he ended up joining the Baptist church. Um, he liked to think of himself basically as your modern Christian. Um, and just, he was not ashamed to be a Baptist. But another thing you got to know about Charles Spurgeon is he was a devout, let me put it on ringer off um calvinist so and he was not ashamed of that uh, i was talking to my buddies actually the other day and they were mentioning how he basically stated that calvinism was the only way um it's the true gospel um and he was pretty pretty adamant about that he was he was very proud to be a baptist he was very proud to be a calvinist and um but a lot of this baptist uh as we will see in a little bit, you know, his association with the Baptist Union um, came into question and then eventually withdrew, but we'll get into that. Um, <clears throat> so he was not he was devout Cal Calvinist. Um, he would not hesitate to be a Baptist. Um, he was later invited to preach in London and um, at um, New Park Secret Chapel, Street Chapel, that's what that says. Okay, and um, he was basically a preaching sen sensation. Um, he was gifted by God, no doubt. Um, they were very impressed. They ended up asking him to stay, I believe it was six months, but then he ended up moving over there and staying permanently. Um, he ended up moving to the, eventually to the Metrop Metropolitan Tabernacle, which seated approximately 5,600 people. So this was pretty intense. He was drawing crowds. He was very, very popular, even in the secular world. The uh, London Times posted some of his stuff, and as well as the New York Times in America. However, he was very unpopular with um, traditional Protestants, and um, he was considered to be a pulpit buffoon or... Uh, because he, he was very animated. He walked, you know, the platform and everything. Um, he paced. He acted out the Bible. Um, he told stories about prostitutes and, um, and, and just babies and people being saved. So he used these things to draw people to um, in, I guess. And um, they just, he basically had it enough with the polite preachers and stuff. So he decided that... Um, um, he was going to be different. He was bold, no doubt. And, uh, yeah. So in order to really understand Charles Spurgeon, you really have to come to the 1880s, um, which we're going to get into the downgrade controversy. Um, the downgrade controversy basically revolves around, um, theological liberalism. Um, Baptist ministers were downgrading the faith, and um, Charles Spurgeon had a problem with it. Um, and then it wasn't until later on down the road he ended up, you know, with the Baptist Union. He he got fed up. He he was quiet for a while, and then he decided he needed to speak up. And he decided um, he would speak up. He couldn't hold his tongue anymore. A lot of it had to do with uh, you got to understand the times though before you get we start getting into the 1880s. Um, Darwinism was a huge issue. A lot of people um, and, and cr critical biblical scholars were um, challenging Christians to reevaluate their biblical understanding. And um, also there's the theological liberalist who um, Christianity basically needed to match up with our, our experience, our emotions. And, you know, these were the realities that we were to interpret our biblical understanding. And um, 
we'll get into some of those issues. Some of the key people during um, liberalists were we mentioned in class were Schleier, Schleiermacher. He had an emphasis on experience. And then one of his students was Ruschel, Ruschel which basically stating that God is love. Um, basic, and we do know that God is love, but what he said went further that that was God rather than being one of God's attributes. And then you had um, another thing that was going on was German higher criticism, which was basically that um, scripture only contains the word of God. But um, it wasn't actual. There was a difference between the Word of God and, and, and Scripture, basically, where Scripture could be challenged. It, it meant it wasn't all of the Word of God. The Word of God can be found elsewhere. So um, that was a big old thing. So um, they basically rejected, um, liberalists rejected the wrath of God. They rejected solo scriptura. Which um, and they decided to rely upon reason and experience. So this was the environment that um, that um, Spurgeon found himself dealing with, and he felt that it was no, it wasn't just like a, an issue of interpretation, but that these people were in challenging core issues, doctrinal issues of the faith, um, such as you know the atoning sacrifice, inspiration of the Holy Scripture, um, justification by faith, and um, so these, just some really, really core stuff. These weren't to be something that just um, was just small issues, like the third tier issues. These were like big core stuff that could not be um, compromised. So um, in 1883, we show um, the essential doctrines being challenged um, uh, with uh, the 1883 conference. Um, Spurgeon urged at the time for, I'm trying to remember what the word that was about, um, Spurgeon urged at the time for an adoption of a confession of faith, and it was rejected by the Baptists, basically, that um, it was basically, it, people were more prone towards individualism and interpreting um, things themselves through reason and experience, so why would they want some creed, you know, to uh, basically weigh them down? Oh, I'm getting a short on time. Um, so, um, so you have this individualism, they're saying no, they're not having it, so, um, um, they rejected it. And then in 1887, Spurgeon comes out in with two articles in The Sword and the Trial, and, uh, addressing, addressing liberalism and the Baptist Union, and this is where he starts, he can't hold his tongue anymore, he's gotta speak out. So, um... <clears throat> He's addressing liberalism. He's addressing the Baptist Union. Um, he ends up, uh, and I quote, I think it, the, 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 he says that the atonement is scouted, that inspiration of scripture is derided, and the Holy Spirit is degraded into an influence. The punishment of sin is turned into fiction, and the resurrection into myth. So these are some really core issues about atonement and Jesus Christ and everything. Um, and which led to a natural decline in spiritual life. We had a weariness of devotional meetings and prayer. People didn't want to come together anymore. Yet um, um, people were basically turning towards, they want to be entertained. You know, and it's just crazy because this is a lot of stuff that we see today in the church. And um, people were also turning away from their historical backgrounds, from um, Baptist roots. So, um, yeah. So Spurgeon was basically, some of the three issues that he was dealing with was the rejection of verbal plenary inspiration that um, the word was in fact the word of God, that um, penal substitutionary atonement of Christ, that he dealt with the sin, he was punished for our sins, he dealt with the wrath of God, spirit, and um, also the future punishment, eternal punishment at that of unbelievers and you know the whole doctrine of hell. Um, so basically what happens is there's this all going back and forth and Spurgeon decides he's had enough. He wants to make a statement. He wants to, he wants to basically... Um, shake them up a little bit so in october 7th october 27th 1887 um spurgeon decides he's going to withdraw from the baptist union he just can't do it anymore he needs to shake them up they need to really understand what it is they're doing and the liberalism and how it's taking over and he wants the liberalists out he's not um he's not wanting to leave any room and, and they try to um adopt some things along the way to uh um satisfy you know people you know like Spurgeon and um but they were going to be Spurgeon wasn't going to be satisfied with you know just vague 
things that allowed liberalists to, liberalists to stay within the Baptist Union because he felt that they were teaching heresy. So um, in 1888, the Baptist Declaration um, of Faith, um, it, did, it was improved, but it was very brief, again, very vague. So Spurgeon wasn't satisfied. Um, Baptist, it left room for Baptist liberals to still be in the Union. And, um, and it basically comes down to um, it didn't really change anything. It didn't really, um, it didn't satisfy um, Spurgeon, so it didn't really answer what is the gospel, you know. So those those key issues, basically those three ones about the um, the verbal plenary inspiration and plenal substitutionary atonement of Christ and future eternal punishment of unbelievers were some pretty core issues that Spurgeon continued to go. So um, he, and they ended up withdrawing, and you know, he didn't come back, and um, so that's basically a gist of understanding running low I'm um, using a lot of time so um, really appreciated learning about him he um, Spurgeon was no joke he he was he was pretty harsh he was he was not your polite preacher like I said and he was out to give it real he was out to give it raw and uncut um, and he made a stand for it you know and just he he's someone who's gone down in history and someone who i admire and respect today not sure i line up with all his beliefs on calvinism but that's being molded and shaped a little bit um he was pretty strict like i said my friends were talking about you know just he basically he believed calvinism believes like that is the true gospel so um it definitely is a challenge to our our beliefs and our faith and something we should be definitely seeking out. So I got a lot of respect for him and um, it's been great uh, researching him and going through this class and everything and um, listening to audio about him. So I definitely encourage others and, and just um, looking forward to uh, learning more. And uh, thank you very much. My name is David Wynn and I will see you soon. <laughs>